Hmm. All right, folks. I think it's about time to get started, if we, uh, if we don't mind. Okay. So, uh, right. It's nice to see everybody. Welcome to another day of 6837. At this rate, we'll have a negative number of students in the classroom in about two weeks. Uh, but hopefully everybody's watching online and staying safe from COVID and all that. Uh, in terms of announcements and stuff, uh, the main one, which I'm sure slash hope you are all aware of, is that homework one is due tomorrow. You do have late days. As a reminder, your late days are in increments of 24 hours from the deadline. It's not like a class period kind of scenario, because um, that would be a lot of late days. Uh, if you have personal difficulties, I know this is a really bizarre semester and you guys are running into all kinds of interesting challenges. Um, that's completely fine and expected. Uh, our course policy is that you check in with S cubed. So if you get an email, if you email me asking for an extension because of a personal circumstance, that's completely understandable and completely fine. But I'm going to tell you, hey, go talk to S cubed and then with their go ahead, we can, we can extend stuff. So I encourage you to do that. That's fine. Um, that policy is in place not because I want to like double check. I don't care. All of you have different personal problems, but more that that is a good juncture to refer you to the right professional office to make sure that you're getting the help you need. So I can use my tiny amount of leverage over your homework to, to make sure that happens. Um, other than that, you have a nano quiz number two, uh, which should go out at the end of class today, uh, God willing, assuming that we manage to configure um, whatever that thing is uh, correctly. Hopefully you all found nano quiz number one to be pretty straightforward. It's just a way to keep you responsible for course content. Any questions, concerns, comments, things you want to talk about? Jokes, ideas, interesting math problems? No, like good recipes? Good recipes. You know, I tried really hard. They had that, that, that Paris Hilton uh, cooking show has like this funfetti cake recipe I was trying to find, but apparently it's only in one issue of Us Magazine that I didn't have access to. <laughs> and I considered asking the library for it, but I thought that that would be kind of an abuse of my privileges as a faculty member. OK, well, if there's no more concerns, that's great. So uh, hopefully you're all done with your homework, and um, you won't be bothering me in my office hours. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, you are all more than welcome to come hang out. It's, it's a pleasure to see you there, really. It's, it's lonely otherwise. I sit there and just look at the wall. OK, so uh, we've, uh, we've wrapped up the first part of our course, um, where we talked about different kinds of transformations and sort of linear algebra plus computer graphics, and hopefully you're all now experts on 2x2, two 3x3, two, three three, and 4x4 four four matrices, which are big uh, objects in this course. Um, now we're going to move on from just setting up static scenes on the computer to the sort of next part of the graphics pipeline, which is to take those static scenes and make them move. And so that'll be the topic of our next several lectures, is to cover different ideas from the world of computer animation. I think these are some of the more fun topics that we cover in this course, and also some of the slightly less challenging ones compared to some of what's before and after it. I think somehow the ideas of, of sort of the basics of computer animation and how an animation system is built are really kind of natural and, and, and basically what you would expect. So today we'll have a little bit of a high level discussion of, of what computer animation looks like and how it compares to hand-drawn animation and, and some of the, the world that came before the computer graphics technology. It's important not just for fun trivia, but also actually a lot of the things that you see in computer animation systems really are almost direct adaptation of what people were doing by hand back in the old, you know, like Disney hand-drawn animation films before we all switched to the computer system. Moreover, actually, the computer systems for computer animation were remarkably early in the history of computing uh, and in the history of, of, you know, visual content on your screen, uh, probably earlier than you would expect. And, and so a lot of these things really were direct adaptations of tools to basically help artists. And over time, that workflow has changed from like 99% on paper and a little bit of like computer work to basically all of the artistic stuff that goes into most of these films is digital. So, um, and then at the end of today's lecture, we'll cover a particular technique called skinning, which I've already kind of alluded to a few times uh, in our lecture uh, in the past. 
which is basically a technique for how to make things deform in a non-rigid way in response to a rigidly moving skeleton underneath. Right? So in our previous lecture, we talked about how to articulate stuff, but the motions that we talked about were basically like a robot, right? Like they're like a bunch of rigid things hooked together by joints. But the reality is, especially for floppy people like your instructor, when you bend your, uh, your joints, you know, things kind of deform and bend and stretch in, in response to that. And we're going to begin to kind of deal with that sort of secondary and, and interesting motion uh, today. So a lot of the animation techniques that we talk about on a computer really have their history in hand-drawn or traditional animation techniques. And of course, many of these techniques have been around for, for most of the 20th uh, century, right? I mean, they date back to the kind of early 1900s. Uh, and, and really, the computer animation has come a long way uh, since then. Um, you know, the original animated content you would sit there and draw every single frame of your, your animated film one after the next, which, as you can imagine, is a pretty painful task to do. You know, your eye senses things at roughly 30 frames a second. So if you really wanted, I, I don't think that animation back then was, was drawn at that, that rate, but if you really wanted to have true looking motion, what that would mean is drawing the most minuscule kind of movements of, of characters from one scene to the next. Now, one of the big developments that happened in animation pre-computers was to go from just hand drawing every single frame like a giant flip book to something called cell animation. Have, have we uh, heard of that before? You probably have. You, you've seen it or you might have some intuition where essentially you might draw like a background frame and then the cell animator would just draw this sort of clear thing that you would place on top of it with the moving characters so that you wouldn't have to draw the entire scene. And roughly, that sort of was, was reflected in some of the early animation systems that we had uh, uh, adapted on the computers. They're just sort of computational techniques to uh, make cell animation more efficient. But actually, if you look at the history of animation, even pre-computation, there were so many cool inventions and interesting ideas that people came up with that sort of anticipated some interesting computer graphics technologies. Um, and, and here's a few of the terms that come up in that world that I think are, are actually kind of familiar in the graphics pipeline today. So one of the, the kind of central ideas of the early animation, almost workforce, I would say, rather than animation techniques, was this idea of keyframing and coming up with in-betweens. So here's the deal. Uh, as you can imagine, it's extremely tedious <laughs> to draw every single frame of an animated character moving around, you know, like Mickey Mouse or... I was going to say Shrek, but I don't think that anybody was, was hand-drawing Shrek. Um, but so essentially, you know, what might happen in an animation studio is that you could hire the really expensive artists uh, to do, you know, the, the really fancy motion, but they didn't want to do all this tedious work of, like, you know, moving characters one little centimeter at a time, or less than that probably, uh, to create all the, the motion in between, right? And so a very typical kind of hierarchy in an animation studio, it would look something like you have one person drawing what they would call the keyframes. It is sort of like the key poses of a character. And then you would hire maybe a different team of artists to do that more tedious work of, of in between, right? This is sometimes like tweening, I think it's sometimes what it's called. And so um, I think what you'll see is when we talk about computer animation, you end up with something very similar, right? Where essentially, instead of having somebody draw a complete keyframes, your keyframes are going to be kind of like knots in your splines. And then the in-betweening is going to be taken care of by the spline curves, which is essentially what we've been talking about the last couple lectures. And so really that analogy carries through um, pretty much completely. And actually the early work on computer animation is, is quick to point that out, that actually a lot of the technical tools we have at our disposal really translate quite nicely uh, to the computational domain. But there were all kinds of other interesting developments that, that got developed to, or, or adapted to the digital world in different and interesting ways. Another kind of fun one was this idea of multi-perspective pan panoramas. Has anybody ever seen one of these? They're really cool. Actually, you're all looking at one right now. Um, so here's the deal. If I'm doing cell animation, of course, one of the big challenges is that I'd like to have a camera be able to kind of scroll across the scene. But that's a really hard thing to do because of perspective, right? Like, like I certainly can't have a lot of the dramatic shots that you see in films today where like a camera scrolls and then maybe you know, pushes into a particular character or something like that because of different perspective effects, right? Things occlude, they get bigger, smaller, they warp, and so on, just due basically to that camera projection that we talked about in our previous lecture. And so one of the really interesting and kind of clever techniques that got invented pretty early was this idea of making a multi-perspective panorama, 
where what you would do is design some long panorama, which is going to be your entire camera shot for the animated film. But you would never see this entire thing at one time, right? You would maybe zoom into just one piece of it. And as you pan your camera across, in this case, it looks like kind of like that. What would happen is that the perspective would slowly change. So like if you look at any single frame, probably the perspective from the left to the right was varying ever so slightly. And so by just scrolling across, you're actually simulating different motions of your camera. Um, this is a really clever idea that was, was adapted by, by Disney. But you can see how essentially that hand-drawn animation pipeline has a lot of limitations, right? I mean, you're coming up with all these clever ideas because you're getting around the fact that you can't have depth in, in some really you know, some really deep and, and important way as, as part of your animated film without just redrawing a million frames, which is extremely expensive. So initially, in the history of animation, people dealt with this by making more and more complex, basically, mechanical devices. Um, so one of the interesting ones is something called the multiplanar camera, exactly what it sounds like. So this is sort of a little piece of technology that uh, came up in the Disney Corporation. and came, I think, kind of in his history just a tiny, tiny bit before um, computer animation became a thing. It looks like 1957. I thought for fun we can watch a little clip uh, as Walt Disney. I think this is actually Walt Disney himself introducing the, the multiplane camera as basically another way to capture depth and, and motion in these animated films, even though they're all hand-drawn and two-dimensional. I think this stuff is so much fun. I could watch this, these kinds of clips all day. Now, this is a kind of drawing. It also came out of our school of self-improvement here at the studio. It is a blueprint of a piece of equipment designed to make cartoons more realistic right. and enjoyable. <laughs> this is the plan for a super cartoon camp. We call it the multiplane camp. It was intended for use in our feature-length cartoon. You see, we decided for features. The camera needed improvement too. Actually, the pre-feature cartoon camera was fairly simple in construction and operation, and generally very satisfactory. The problem was how to take a painting and make it behave like a real piece of scenery under the camera. The trouble was we were photographing a flat two-dimensional background. <laughs> I love the music. <laughs> so we set about making plans and blueprints for a new cartoon camera that would overcome this. The different elements in the scene were separated according to their varying distances from the viewer. This put the moon on a plane farthest away from the camera. With our original picture broken down in this manner, it is possible to control the relative speed with which each individual part of it moves to or away from the camera. But the moon remains absolutely still, and so it will always remain the same, neither growing nor shrinking in size. Since this new camera used many planes, we called it a multiplane camera. Uh, I think they, do they actually show a final clip? <laughs> and here now is our same moonlight scene, the way the multiplane camera sees it. As you can okay. see, we finally got the moon to keep its proper distance. All right, so you can see that the, the early inventions for computer animation were really clever, and it, it really was one of these fields that was just innovating constantly. But you can also see the demand for computer technology, because even using this multiplane camera, I'm sure, was like hell on wheels to, to get it to, to work correctly. And can, you can only imagine dealing with that plus a moving character on top of the scene, right? So um, historically, um, really all the usual players and companies that you're used to hearing about were the ones that were sort of early in the um, computer graphics industry uh, in innovating some of the computational tools. Um, you may or may not know that Pixar, which I think you all think of as an animation studio, was originally a tech company and actually was sort of contracted out by Disney in the 80s to write some software uh, packages and, and hardware to actually do some of the early computer graphics techniques. And here's actually an early uh, computer graphics animation test. Whoa. And I think what's really amazing about this clip is how advanced it is. Um, this is the 80s. <laughs> In this way, 
squash, and stretch, the elements of elasticity that make Disney character animation stand out from all the rest wouldn't be lost. But they can't do these days. In hands-on right. animation, the next step after the storyboard has been completed is the pencil hmm. test. A rough pencil drawing to show the action. In computer animation, I should probably keep talking through this clip or they're going to cut off the video on YouTube because of the Disney content. Uh. <laughs> Once the vector test is approved, the real work begins. Each piece of vector animation must be modeled and shaped. In this case, the characters were painted by computers. So hopefully by the end of this course, you all will be able to make animation that's roughly this quality. <laughs> Let's take a look at the test from Reese Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are, which was directed by John Lassen. Yeah, the shading is interesting. I'm not, I'm not really sure what the theory was. Okay. So, what was that? Yeah, it was a mix of 3D and 2D, and I'm sure that somebody had to go through a lot of those frames and just hand paint stuff on that they couldn't quite get to work. Um, but I think what's really impressive is, for one, just, I mean, if you think about the animators at that time, relative to what they could do with that multiplanar camera, I mean, if you think back to that clip that we just watched, there's no comparison, right? I mean, you had a camera that was like digging underneath the bed, making all kinds of crazy turns, you had perspective changing characters that were occluding one another and moving around in ways that just wouldn't work with the early technology that was there. And so really, the computer technology evolved not just as a way to put artists out of work, although it, it did also evolve partially for that reason at some of the cheaper studios, but also because it really changed the artistic medium, right? I mean, like the films that you see now look so different from the animated films of the 1930s and 40s, and that, that's not just because you know, we got tired of like, you know, the Disney people doing their little motions. It, it really was a different art form altogether and, and continues to evolve today, right? I mean, one of the kind of fun things that you hear a lot in the computer graphics industry is that, like somehow it always takes roughly the same amount of time to render a film, which is weird because computers keep getting faster. And, and, and the reason is that, of course, well, every time the computer gets faster, the technology gets a little better, the demand for some new effect or, or, or change to uh, the technology appears before you know it, right? And so there's some kind of conservation law uh, in action there, like the total amount of time people are willing to take to make a film. So in any event, um, the original kind of cell animation tools were basically just adaptations of a lot of the processes you saw in the hand-drawn things. And slowly, that started to get departed from. Um, and so eventually, what ended up happening is the technology really evolved into its own um, art form. And there's some really interesting early works that are worth a read if you guys are bored in like this sort of historical uh, perspective. So, so one of the early uh, research papers um, out there, this is actually, I think, published at um, ACM SIGGRAPH or whatever the precursor to that was, uh, really talked about how to link the principles of, of traditional animation to 3D computer animation and, and, and so on. And the authors were uh, folks at the early uh, uh, animation studio. Unfortunately, since then, I think this particular author had some not so great stuff uh, behavior wise. No, but the. Um, unfortunately, these systems will also enable people to produce more bad computer animation. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I think you saw a lot of that too. Um, yeah, that's uh, certainly they made it much more efficient to make low quality uh, computer art. In fact, I would argue the, the very first Pixar short is really horrifying. I mean, this thing with this baby crawling around, it's like, it like, looks like it's made of porcelain. Um, but essentially, a lot of the early technology just was trying to adapt some of these principles of, of hand-drawn animation to the computational domain. Here I'm showing you an image of a really famous book. Has anybody heard of, of this one before? It's called The Illusion of Life. It's really fun. I encourage you to, to take a look, you know, drop by your local library and, and page through. Um, essentially, these folks, uh, I guess Thomas and Johnson, uh, 
tried to kind of lay out some of the principles of the animated world and, and how you could go about communicating and being expressive in this particular medium. And it's really fascinating stuff. I mean, one of the things that I realized working in this field is just how little it has to do with real life, but how self-consistent it is. This is actually a really fascinating project. People in machine learning have even tried to study this, but like physics in a Disney movie make no sense, right? Like at all. And, and the more you look at the physics, the weirder it, it, it becomes in your mind, right? Like, for instance, we'll see, um, actually maybe let's, let's take a look here. So let's say the, so here on the, on the left-hand side, we're showing the path of a kind of typical animated bouncing ball. What are all the problems with this path? Yeah, so for one, the ball kind of squashes to roughly half of its size when it hits the ground. But there's actually even more subtle things than that. Um, yeah, and then, so more than that, after it squashes, it kind of launches off the ground and stretches quite a bit. I guess you could maybe come up with some kind of elastic material that does that. But actually, the most troubling aspect, which I think a lot of people don't even notice, is that the ball anticipates that it's going to hit the ground. Right? Causality is completely not you know, validated by this image. If you look on the left-hand side, the ball gets longer before it, it knows that the floor is there. And these are sort of very typical principles of, of, of hand-drawn animation, right? They call this uh, kind of scenario squash and stretch, right? That you tend to anticipate motion, stretch out, squash, and so on. And these sort of animated motions are, are ones that really make no sense in the real world, but were part of the art form from, from the very beginning. And the really kind of fascinating thing is that oftentimes they're very self-consistent, right? Like this, this book was able to lay out a lot of principles that really are like, you know, almost the Newton's laws of the, the animated world, but are also completely nonsensical from the perspective of like what's around us every day. Uh, and, and of course, there are all kinds of other examples, you know, like timing is another one that we see a lot, right? That light objects tend to move more quickly, heavy objects move more slowly, which of course, again, has nothing to do with like how gravity works uh, and everything to do with how we can communicate expressively uh, information that otherwise might be kind of hard to infer from, from a 2D image. Yes? That's a fascinating question. I, I don't know the answer at all, right? So our, our colleague is asking um, if we, you know, are these laws somehow natural? Like maybe they're built into your, your physiology and your brain and like you, these are just exaggerations of what you expect to see in real life? Or could you come up with some completely different self-consistent physics system and if I watch film long enough, you would be okay with it? Yeah, I don't know the answer. There's, there's a lot of really good questions here. So in any event, these sorts of ideas have been have found their way into film in really interesting ways. And it's become a bit of a challenge to do that in the computational domain because a lot of the computational techniques we have really are based on physics and mathematics. And so some of these like really non-physical and strange kind of made up motions that you wouldn't expect to see can be kind of hard to replicate in, in the animation world. But of course, these days our films look something more like uh, you know, Lightning uh, McQueen here. And, and really, rather than having people hand draw every frame of our, our animated films, we now have computers do this. One of the really cool things is just to look at the statistics about how much time it takes to make a single frame, including you know, rendering and animation and the physics simulation and so on. Uh, for example, here, uh, this is Cars, which of course is a little bit dated now, which I think took something like 100 uh, hours per frame for certain frames of this film. And of course, that's completely fine because you know we just watch them played back like a flip book. You know, it's not like we have to watch the computer uh, do the animation at, at the same time that it's being produced. Uh, but you know, as of maybe you know 20, 30 years ago, some of the major sources of, of really high power computation were happening at the animation studios, right? So um, one of the really fun things about working at a place like this is you have access to what you call a render farm which is basically you know, the same kind of pool of servers where you can send your compute tasks that I think these days we, we associate with, with machine learning uh, uh, kind of places. Of course, the demands, uh, depending on your, your application, are quite different. You know, if you're in the, the video game uh, world, then you can't do computer-based animation in a way that takes 100 hours per frame uh, because, of course, that wouldn't make for a very exciting video game. And so the trade-off there in terms of fidelity is, is quite different. So anyway, those are some of the kind of fun considerations that happen in the computer animation world.
And really, I think when you look at the algorithms and the technology that's in this space, you see reflected in it a very long history of this art form. And moreover, the kind of nice things you see art affecting science and science affecting art, right? Obviously, animated films have really evolved over the years and continue to. I mean, if you watch something from five, 10 years ago, it'll feel probably a little more data than you think it will. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, you know, the, the demands of the artists are changing the way that this, this technology uh, uh, changes. And there's many other interesting directions to go, incidentally. I mean, one of the kind of fun things that was pointed out to me a couple years ago was that many of our animated films in, in 3D content kind of have the same look right now. And there's a lot of really interesting questions out there about like, well, that look isn't the real world. It's just like this look. So maybe there are other ones, you know, like maybe there are other adaptations out there. And, and you see people kind of experimenting with that just a little bit on the fringes. So now let's talk about computer based animation and some of the kind of basic techniques that are out there. And this will roughly parallel the, uh, the lectures that we'll have in this course. So the sort of most basic type of computer animation is keyframing. And this really parallels exactly what people were doing in the animation studios before computers, right? So essentially, you could spend a lot of time as an artist painstakingly placing, in this case, your rigidly flying bunny at, at assorted uh, poses. And then you could rely on things like splines. Now, the spline curves are not just in space, but in space and time, right? Which are tracing out the path of this object as it moves, right? And so now your splines are maybe not like you know, just drawing some curve, but rather like one axis is time and the other is like maybe the angle of a joint. And you're using the, uh, the knots and, and the tangents of your, your, your spline to control the motion, how exaggerated it is, how fast it is, and so on. In fact, I think you see that in a lot of these user interfaces, right? You see the 3D preview on top, and then underneath you'll see like the spline curve, which is like the x-coordinate in time, and you can control that in different ways. The orange dot is the origin. Well, in fact, actually, well, normally I would agree with you. Uh, this diagram does happen to draw an origin right next to the object. So I'd say, <laughs> no. The um, for the rabbit mesh is the point on the rabbit mesh of maybe there's an origin. That could be. I, I'm not sure that's really relevant to the discussion right now. Uh, right. So in any event, we can use tools like uh, uh, you know keyframing to essentially take care of the fact that, you know, computer or not, we don't want to draw 30 frames a second, you know, and, and, and so uh, essentially it's exactly the same role that, that an in-betweener would serve before. But this is only one kind of animation, and there are many others. So another one is, is procedural animation. Um, this is one that really came about as a result of computers being available, where now I can do my animation by writing code. Right? So a simple example would be to animate a clock with, you know, different hands moving around. In case you're wondering, that's, that's what it looks like. Um, and obviously, you would write a, a, a piece of code here that would maybe generate the angles and positions of the hand based on the time. Now, that's kind of a boring procedural animation, but procedural animation tools these days are used for all kinds of really crazy things. You know, maybe I have my two hordes of characters coming in to fight for the future of Narnia and the ring and whatever, and they're all, you know, pouring down a hill and running and this and that. Um, many times you probably don't want to hire, you know, 500 actors to charge at each other and uh, with, with like sharp objects. And so you can actually procedurally generate this animation because it's not like they're thinking super intelligently at that moment in the, the scene, right? They're just charging and they're being viewed at a very distant angle. And so a lot of times uh, these kinds of things are just generated automatically. Um, it's actually kind of an interesting combination of fluid simulation and, and coding uh, and, and kind of human motion. Uh, in other settings, for example, um, procedural animation can be used to generate sort of infinite content. So some video games, you can just like keep driving along the road and they'll just keep making more, more road. And how would you do that? Well, you could imagine coming up with some randomized rules that generate kind of plausible looking settings. And so in that case, this sort of procedural environment is being used to just present the user with a bigger and bigger virtual uh, universe. Another type of animation that we'll do uh, a bit of in this course, in fact, your assignment three, question mark, um, will be in physically based animation. Again, this is a phrase that you hear a lot in this domain. We're not doing physics, we're doing physically based things. Right? The idea being that we don't really need our physics to be totally accurate uh, to get very visibly plausible content. Yeah, so a physics engine would be a particular tool that's used in a video game to simulate physics. Um, 
Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, you know, physics engines are, are a tricky trade-off because you, there, there are many different trade-offs between efficiency and quality that you can imagine when you're trying to capture uh, physics dynamics. I think a lot of the changes you see right now in the physics world have to do with phenomena like fluids, which are really hard to simulate in real time. But physically-based animation, essentially, is trying to generate a lot of that secondary motion that you probably wouldn't want to keyframe as an artist, right? It would be a lot of work to, like, you know, fly a flag in your animated film and keyframe every single flap in the wind. And moreover, have, you know, if you had two flags next to each other, it would be pretty painful to animate them both flapping the same way. Uh, and so physically-based animation is used to fill in all those important details that you probably don't want to do by hand. At the same time, it's also not very controllable, right? It could be really difficult if physics is playing a role, like it's kind of a character in your, your animated film, which happens a lot. You know, then, then controlling physically-based animation while making it look physical is, is a very difficult, and by the way, non-physical task, you know? Like, it's not like something that we do in our, our everyday life. So uh, there are all kinds of fun physically-based animation tools and algorithms. We're going to cover in this class uh, some simple ones based on sort of masses and springs, and we'll talk about cloth simulation. Um, if you're ever bored and you just want to watch impressive stuff, you should go onto YouTube and just watch clips of physically-based animation tools. So for instance, here's one um, with a bunch of sort of fluid simulations that I think are just, I think these are actually pretty straightforward demos of some of the software that's out there. And you see that it's, it's really impressive. I mean, I think because you guys are all wowed by this, this clip, but you, you watch animated films all the time and, and they all have water in them. It's, not, it's somehow not even a big deal. But it's, it's, if you step back and think about it, it's, it's really incredible that, that we're able to simulate these things in a, in a virtual environment. And with this slick soundtrack. Uh huh. Kind of. I want to tell you. Um, I did use that when we were putting the water. They actually hired a physicist for water animation. I'm sure they hired more than one physicist for water yeah, animation. I guess like I, if, if we're already at this stage, why do we still need physicists? Why do we? <laughs> You know, as, as a person who dropped out of physics his freshman year of college, I, 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 I too sympathize with that question. Um, no, it's, it's... Austin Frank, like, you know, I don't know if you've heard this, most of the physics water was again where, like, a lot of tiny balls flowing. Yeah, there, there are many different ways to do fluid simulation out there. Um, physics gets more and more advanced in every one of these films. So some of the basics fluids have been out there for a long time, but making it more efficient, and then uh, I would imagine in a film like Moana, where it's, like, everywhere, um, then uh, suddenly the, the details and the accuracy probably matter even more. Yes? Uh, if watching these videos, does it ever get existential to you? Like, <laughs> you can so vividly simulate what is natural phenomenon? It's actually a reasonable question to ask, and it's one that the computer graphics community worries about a bit. Um, so the question is, like, is this like an existential problem? You know, I'm watching these films, like, these look pretty realistic. And it's true, when I watch people give talks in physically based animation, they show negative examples, and I'm like, this looks fine. Um, a lot of times, apparently our brains are really bad at processing this. They'll have like turbulent fluids that are like decreasing in volume by like half and you just don't even see it. Um, yeah, no, the computer graphics community is constantly navel gazing and worrying about like, is graphics solved? Like, should we all just move on and do big data? And some, pe <laughs> some people say yes. Um, I would argue that a lot of these tools are extremely inefficient. Wait, you certainly don't see fluids that look like this in a video game. I'm sure these frames were not being generated on the fly. Um, moreover, in the film content, I mean, it requires a really specialized artist to be able to do this kind of stuff right now. Right? This is not the kind of thing you can go home and do with any kind of control. And so there are a lot of really great frontiers in this space. But you're right, a lot of the, the basic problems, I don't know about solved, but they're, they're reasonable tools. Oh, it also, yeah, that's a great question. And there's some ethical questions related to that as well. I mean, so the question was, you know, does that bring into question what you experience in reality? The answer is absolutely. This is real lifelike content. And anytime you watch a film on YouTube, you should be asking whether it's real or not. And <laughs> you laugh, but I, I mean, you can imagine the implications, especially in human-based animation, are, are really frightening. And, and you're seeing that right now. <laughs> OK. So, uh, you know, fluid simulation uh, clips are just so much fun. There's also um, some interesting things sort of at the intersection of like not quite AI and also not quite physics. Um, there's some really interesting research that tries to infer different human motions based on basically the sort of joints that you have and then the physics that surrounds them. 
And, and some of these works are, are really impressive for generating procedural characters that interact with the scene without any guidance from an animator at all. Let's you know, skip over all the nice con the, you know, math and just look at some fun clips. So there's a synthesized backflip here into a square, apparently. It's actually your instructor. <laughs> Incidentally, for those of you who are familiar with reinforcement learning and, and robotics, a lot of the same algorithms that were developed in that space are used here. The nice thing here is that like, if your RL algorithm fails for some reason, your character falls a little bit, maybe you change the physics instead of changing your algorithm. And that's, that's, a, that's okay in, in graphics. You can't do that in, in, in robotics. It's actually really fascinating also from biomechanical perspective. I think that actually some of the technology here has uh, really changed the way that biomechanics people think about the human body because you can learn a lot about like what notions are natural and which ones are, are learned. And, and there's some really fun things to, to, to get here. Okay, so <laughs> this is making me feel uh, self-conscious. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Talk about existential uh, crisis. Yeah, that's, uh, I certainly can't backflip like that guy. Um, right, so. Those are the kinds of animations we'll talk about in this course. If you go to a conference like ACM SIGGRAPH every year, there's all kinds of cool technical tools uh, that combine you know, some amount of physics, some amount of learning, some amount of modeling, some amount of whatever, gestalt, and, and, and put all these things together uh, to come up with, with clever tools that change uh, from year to year. And the cool thing about this technology is it often does get adopted. You know, A lot of times in the research community, we develop these cool tools and they just don't get used. So the nice thing is that, in a sense, especially in animated films, the risk is a lot lower. I mean, if you think about it, like you just have to generate those frames, and then if your code crashes, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and that happens a lot. Like I think a lot of graphics code is really hacked together and terrible because, like, the second that it made those those frames, you never need it again. Um, in fact, I think in physically based animation, this happens a lot. Like, it's really hard to make a fluid simulation that's stable. In fact, actually, one of the harder fluid simulations to make is just still water. <laughs> Um, and uh, so one thing that'll happen often is that like, well, I only need a one second clip. So if my fluid like explodes in two seconds, that's kind of fine. Um, <laughs> so there, there's some interesting things that happen. Okay, so for now, we're gonna talk about animation that's largely just an analog of hand-drawn animation and, and, and how to control that. And like we've already kind of alluded to, essentially, we don't want to control like every single vertex on a triangle mesh, nor do we want to control every single frame in a 30 frame per second film. So instead, we've developed all kinds of tools that are essentially giving low dimensional control to the motion of a character or another object in a scene. And we've already seen that in this course. So for example, we've talked about joint angles. Um, and we can get you know, rigid motions by drawing splines in rotation and transformation space. And really, when we talk about this kind of thing, we're talking about these two stages of the animation pipeline. When you say pipeline, by the way, this doesn't have to happen in like a very rigid order, but this is just kind of roughly what goes on in an animation studio. And essentially what we're covering are modeling and, and rigging, and then eventually animation, I guess, as well. Right? So modeling has to do with like making a single character in a single pose. And then what happens during the rigging stage is that you now want to figure out how that character moves in response to the different joint angles changing. Right? That's, what, that's what we mean by, by rigging. Here they've got that little, I don't know what the thing is called. I guess marionette, is that right? Um, like the NSYNC, Backstreet Boys? <laughs> anyway, um, right. And essentially the basic tools for, for doing this are, are precisely what we talked about in our previous lecture, right? Forward and inverse uh, kinematics. And so essentially these two tools, which we talked about last time, are roughly two different ways that we could use to generate an animation, right? So in forward kinematics, what would we do? We would draw like a spline curve in time of like your different joint angles. And as you do that, the computer is generating motions of a character. Incidentally, the term that's often used here is bones to describe the kind of rigidly moving parts of the character, which I think is completely unsurprising. And really the angles of your joints in that case are the low dimensional controls that, that you're, you're moving around in your, your animated content. And now in inverse kinematics, you also could imagine generating animation. So maybe I animate like the position of your hand and I use an IK solver to place all of those joints in response to that motion. That's probably a more natural thing to animate, but as we talked about last time, it can be quite unstable. 
And there's all kinds of, like if you go to art school, you learn all kinds of techniques for how to design these kinds of spines in a way that looks natural. And it's really funny because a lot of it really does kind of overlap with the technical language that we've developed, right? So for instance, apparently if you're using cubic splines for the motion of your character, you never want two joints to have like knots in their spine curves at the same time. Right, so remember that our spine curves are, are made by like joining together lots of different cubics. And so like if your elbow has a cubic that changes from one cubic to the other at time one, then like your wrist had better not do that. It better happen at like time 1.1 or 0 0.9 or else you like kind of look like you're doing the robot. And, and so there's all kinds of rules out there that essentially <laughs> are somewhere between art and, and mathematics. They're, they're kind of fun to read about. So today we're going to talk about a technique called skinning, where last time we talked about embedding that skeleton and now we're going to kind of combine the modeling stage and the rigging stage, right? So in the modeling stage, we made like a triangle mesh of a character in a T-pose. It's exactly what it sounds like. And now um, we're going to embed that skeleton, which is articulated in the mesh. And when I bend the skeleton, I need to bend the mesh in uh, response. And there's so many different ways to do this, by the way. This is like the term skinning and skinning-based animation refers to a whole class of techniques. Because of course, like, actually predicting the motion of your skin, if you wanted to do it in a 100% accurate way, would require like a CT scan of the, the animated character, right? You need to know every single material in the interior. We don't know that information, so anything we do here is essentially just the model. Um, another term that is often used here is binding, the idea that essentially you have these vertices on your triangle mesh and you're binding them to the motion of the underlying skeleton. I think all the terms here are, are Kind of like if I just asked you to talk about this stuff, probably the ones that you would use. Incidentally, related to these techniques is a technique called motion capture. We've briefly mentioned this in the course before, where maybe I attach a bunch of markers to my character. These days, actually, markerless motion capture, I think, is, is a popular option for obvious reasons. Um, and now we use high speed cameras and all these other things to kind of figure out the positions of all the joints of some uh, person or actor as they move, or horse, apparently. Um, and then we can transfer that onto an animated character. There's a lot of discussion in the animation community, by the way. It's kind of funny. Like, some animation studios are a little bit snobby about mocap uh, because, of course, you know, we talked about all those non physical motions that animated characters take and that's somehow part of the art. But that can't really happen if the character motion was gotten from mo mocap, right? Because that was just right off of a physical world, right? So it might be like Shrek moving around. But the reality is Shrek is just following a bunch of markers that, that we found uh, in 3D. And so certain studios are really snotty about like, this is a motion capture free studio kind of thing. Um, other studios, I think, want to make films more quickly and, and have no such uh, qualms. And it's not clear that they're any more or less successful, but that's a different matter. Um, Mocap is used these days for all kinds of tasks. Um, I think these are actually relatively dated images. I should replace them. I think the, the, the more recent systems use far fewer markers I mean, I think it would be hard to convince an expected, expensive, fancy actor to come in and like glue a bunch of stuff to their face. And so a lot of technology has been developed uh, to improve things. Um, so here's an example of an old uh, mocap system. This is actually a fairly dated one. Um, and I think a lot of the motion that you see in video games, especially in these sort of, what do you call them, like interstitial kind of scenes, like in between the action. Um, cut scenes, thank you, are, uh, are captured uh, using this, this kind of technology. And it really does make animation more efficient, right? Like uh, making this animation happens in real time. <laughs> you know, you're, you're seeing it happen. Um, so the way that we do motion capture is really not all that different from what we'll talk about in the hand-drawn animation. The only difference is the degrees of freedom, right? So in mocap, what's moving around are these markers, and there's some inverse problem you need to solve to get the joint angles from those. Um, but then once you have them, you can transfer them to your, your character. Typically, you probably have to smooth it out a little bit in time to, to get rid of that measurement inaccuracy. Um, another kind of challenge is something called retargeting, right? So my favorite, favorite example of retargeting was a research paper from MIT, actually, while I was, I had a high school internship in this data center the year that it opened, and they came out with this research paper, and it's still really memorable to me, where they had two grad students walk, and one kind of put their hands on the hips with permission of the other, and they, they walked together like this. And they like kind of control the horse moving around, you know, because they're like four legs and like the other, you know, had his arms. Um, obviously, the joints in that physical character were quite different from like the horse or elephant or whatever that they were animating. 
And so that process of like transferring the motion of one thing onto another is called retargeting. Retargeting is definitely an art and not a science, right? Like you're taking joint angles from a physical human and then like transferring them to like an octopus or something is not like an obvious thing. Moreover, it's an interesting challenge if you're an actor, you know, you're, you're sort of not acting as yourself, you're acting as this virtual character and those, those might not be the same. These days, of course, we have a lot of tools for mark markerless uh, motion capture. So here I'm showing you a precursor to um, what I think we see a lot of today. So this is some research out of uh, EPFL. I kind of like this video clip because you can see the kind of raw sensor input and, and how it gets translated. And of course, these days, uh, you all probably have some version of markerless motion capture in your, your pocket, and it can help you do really important things. So one of the big uh, developments in our research field, of course, was that you can now have the CEO of Apple control the turd emoji, um, which actually, I mean, it, it's, it's goofy because it is and very low stakes. But the reality is that this was a very early demo of like motion capture in your pocket. Uh, and exactly this technology now is being used for all kinds of things, right? Like logging into your phone, animation, and this Fox thing. Of course, these are extremely over smooth and it's fine because they're emoji. And of course, at the, the sort of industrial level, exactly the same technology is being used, right? So like, for instance, here we see a little clip from Pirates of the Caribbean. There's the actor. Kind of interestingly, they put him in an environment that looks like what's in the film. And then, uh, you know, they, they replace him with a lot of additional motion on top. I think his, do you call it a beard? I don't know. I, I think the thing is playing piano. <laughs> So obviously, I think he was unable to control that particular aspect as an actor, I hope. Um, he says, that as a pianist myself, I'm not sure I, I would have good intuition for that art form. Um, but at the same time, like the basic motions of the character were, 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 were made that way. Yes? CGI versus prosthetics. I'm not the right guy to ask. Yeah, I have no idea. But but you certainly see a lot of the same like old school physical tricks, like you know, make a little panorama of the the scene and like put a tiny camera in it. Like, that still happens today. It's it's not completely digital. Um, what the digital stuff has allowed you to do is to like do a bad job of some aspects of that 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 analog world and then kind of fix it later in in post. And that's the kind of thing that you couldn't do before, right? So uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting really bizarre art form out there. Um, Industrial Light and Magic is a really fun studio if you ever get the opportunity to go tour and see what they're up to. Um, all right, so as promised, our final topic of discussion for today is, you know, I feel like today's discussion is largely kind of high level and, and pictures and, and terminology, but I do have to put some equations on the slide. And next time we're gonna do, um, we'll do physics and there'll be plenty of, of, of equations, so, so not to worry. Uh, but we'll talk about a very typical technique uh, in character animation that's called skinning or, or and I was just unclear whether it's enveloping or enveloping, but I'll let, I'll let you uh, fill it in as you wish. Okay, so remember our goal here. We know how to animate a bone hierarchy and now we're trying to animate whatever this thing is. Okay, so, so really sitting underneath this guy is the skeleton. The artist has embedded it, meaning that like we know the rest pose of all the joints of the skeleton and of the mesh but we have this one additional piece of information, which is how to bend the skeleton, and now we want to bend the mesh with it. Okay, so that's our, our goal here. So today we're gonna to cover one technique, which I think is basically, I'm not sure that precisely this algorithm is, is implemented in, in video games, but, but variations of it are. Um, this is called skeletal subspace deformation, or SSD. I think sometimes the term skinning is also used specifically to refer to this particular method, but that's kind of a fuzzy line. Um, there are a lot of different other terms for this, vertex blending, matrix palette skinning, linear blend skinning. I think linear blend skinning is, is pretty common. Um, this is like a weird phenomenon in the computer graphics industry. Like when you come out with your graphics tool, you give like a new name to the same algorithms, which is mildly annoying. Photoshop is really bad about this. Right, so in, in, in SSD, essentially what's gonna go on is that every bone is going to induce some rigid deformation of space. Right, so think about like if I have just my arm bone here and I bend my arm, then there's some rigid motion that like takes my, my arm bone from this position to that one. Right? It's not the same rigid motion that's happening in my upper arm. It is, it's just this guy. But I could imagine taking all of 3D space around this arm bone and deforming it. 
right? Like rotating all of space 90 degrees about this joint angle here, right? Similarly, my upper arm doesn't move. And so what's going to go on? Like for every vertex of this triangle mesh, if that vertex followed my upper arm, it rotated 90 degrees about this point. If that vertex followed, oh, sorry, lower arm, if it followed my upper arm, then it just didn't move, right? And so what we're going to do in linear blend skinning is exactly what it sounds like. We're going to come up with skinning weights, which say, if I moved 100% with my upper arm, then my position would be here. If I moved 100% with my lower arm, my position would be somewhere else, right? Like, I guess my, this part of my arm would be down here somewhere. <laughs> And I'm going to have weights that basically average those results as I move along the surface, right? So like points here would probably move 50% with this joint and 50% with that one or something like that. Those are called skinning weights. Okay, so that's going to be our, our basic technique here is that every vertex is going to come up, it's going to have a list of numbers. These are called skinning weights, which is basically a weighted average. It's basically saying my motion is 80% this joint and like 20% that joint, something like that. So there's sort of two things that we have to do. The first is talk about where do those weights come from, and the second one is to talk about the math of how to actually pull that deformation off. Incidentally, that deformation is made particularly annoying because remember that the deformation of your skeleton is itself defined using this big chain of transformations we talked about last time, which now you have to apply to the outer surface. Yeah, so it's, it's not entirely obvious. So in terms of these skinny weights, we're going to use this notation WIJ. I think I'm consistent. I double-checked the slides before class today which says essentially the I's are going to index vertices on the triangle mesh and the J's are going to index bones. <laughs> okay, so WIJ says how much does vertex I move in response to bone J? Does that make sense? So for example, if WIJ equals one, it says that like if this bone moves that much, then this vertex just moves with that, that bone. Okay, and so these are called skinning weights, this, this big basically matrix of, of values, right? So there's like one row per vertex and one column per, per bone. And these are um, typically visualized like this image that you see here, right? So here, this would be like maybe the, the skinning weights associated to the motion of the upper, the forearm of whatever this, this creature is, right? And you can see that the skinning weights are large along his forearm, meaning that if this part moves, these probably go with it. But then they drop off smoothly as you move off to the other parts of, of the body because what you wouldn't want is like for him to bend his arm and then you just like see a crease show up because like, you know, parts of the surface are just not moving in response to that, that joint changing. Okay, and so these are, again, these are called skinning weights, I think is the most typical term here. And so there's a couple properties that you typically have for these weights and they basically just correspond to being a weighted average, right? So they're, they're positive and they sum to one. That makes sense? So every single vertex on the triangle mesh, which is the thing you want to deform, has a list of numbers, one per bone, and those numbers are positive and they sum to one because they're like the influences of the different bones on the, the motion of that vertex. Does anybody know, uh, by the way, if you're a math student, does that, does that definition sound familiar? Have you ever heard a phrase? Pro it's true, yeah, it's a probability measure, or a distribution, I guess, in this case, over the, the set of bones. Um, but it's indexed per point on a, on a surface, which actually has a special name in math if you've taken Differential geometry or PDE? There's usually one. Ah, next time. Um, this is called a partition of unity, is the phrase. Um, and it's exactly the same thing. So if you read research papers in this space, that's the phrase that they'll use. A partition of unity just means like a set of functions on a surface that add up to one at every point and are positive, which is exactly what skinning weights are. Um, so it's kind of nice because math people have studied these objects for a very long time, and it turns out to be precisely what you'd want in um, uh, skinning-based animation. The reason why you wouldn't want your skinning weights to be negative, by the way, what would happen? It would mean like this joint moves this way and some vertex moves the other way, right? That would, would be a negative weight. So that wouldn't be so good. It could lead to funny animation. It could lead to funny animation. And indeed, uh, when you have bugs in your code, it, it will lead to, to funny animation. Right, so a, a typical, whoa, a typical practical, oh no, did I just undo our video? No. A typical uh, uh, practical uh, thing that happens here Typically, the number of skinning weights that are non-zero at a given vertex is capped at some value. That makes sense, right? I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a creature where like one bone moves, like somehow like a point on the surface is significantly affected by the motion of like 10 different bones or something. Of course, there's an exception to every rule, and I'm sure you're all thinking of one right now. Um, so here's another visualization of skinning weights. I think this is actually an easier one to digest. So here's this character. By the way, you see this, uh, 
uh, rotund uh, uh, bunny quite a bit because it's an open source character, so a lot of us test uh, uh, software out there. Um, and you can see the skinny weights are really just like painted on functions that are big near a given joint. That, that's all they are. And then if I sum these functions from left to right per vertex, I get one. That's the point. Any questions about that, like what skinny weights are? Yes. Oh, that's that's a that's a good question. So 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 Ari correctly points out that like on the surface it looks like the mesh is denser in some places than others. Um, that's actually independent of skinning weights. That's just the function of the particular mesh we chose for this character. Um, but it is true that you probably would want to put more vertices in parts that are likely to deform because you want to resolve that that motion. Um, here's another visualization of of skinning weights. Um, here's our our, our guy again. Um, where essentially what we've done is like taken a weighted average of a set of colors, one per bone, and so you can see that like, you know, his his leg here is green, and then there's a smooth transition to the weight for the upper one. Now the question is, where do these skinning weights come from? Um, and there's basically two options. Um, one, which is the most prevalent, is that you paint them, <laughs> right? So a very typical thing to do in this painstaking animation process, you first make your basic animated character, then you put the skeleton inside of it, which is itself kind of an annoying task. And then literally an artist will just paint a partition of unity onto the surface. It says like this bone has this effect on every vertex. And there's like some tools in like Maya and Blender and these, these kinds of, of, of things uh, to do that in a way that's not too painful. Uh, this is also a problem that academics love to study. So for fun, I replaced all the screenshots in this paper with one from Wong and Solomon 2021, which of course is the state of the art tool for this particular task. Um, artists don't like the automatic tools a whole lot because, again, they want control, right? They want to know, like, if I bend this joint precisely where the transition from my wrist to my forearm happens, and, and, and you know, tools that are based on, on differential equations are unlikely to give you that. Okay, so that's, we've now kind of defined our enemy, right? Like, we have bones and we have weights, which are, like, the motion. Now we have to actually do the math of how to compute the vertex position so in other words, I bend my skeleton, then what? Yeah? So here's the basic idea. For, for, for one, we want to take every vertex i and bend it with every single bone j to kind of solve this. You know, you can think of this as sort of saying, like, if vertex i were to move with bone j, where would it go? Right? And then what we're going to do is just blend the results um, using the skinning weights. Does that make sense, that kind of high-level picture? So here's what that looks like. So here, I take each pi, remember those are the vertices of the triangle mesh, and I transform them with matrix tj, which is the motion of bone j, for every single ij pair, and that makes this pij prime uh, variable. So again, pij prime is where vertex i went under transformation j, and then to get that final position, like pi prime on the bottom left, I just take a weighted average with respect to the w's. OK, so this is like feels easy enough to implement in code. And, and it is. It's, it's really not that, that difficult. Um, the, the headache is just that the tj's here are, are actually defined by big chains of matrix multiplies, right? Because they are defined by like moving up and down your skeleton hierarchy like we talked last time. And so in reality, when you want to do this kind of thing, you're going to be like traversing that hierarchy of bones and computing those tij's all at the same time. And that is a very easy thing to get wrong, as you soon will see. Um, right, so then here's a kind of an illustration of what's going on here. So you can see that like I have two different motions for the two bones, and like in these two regions, like on the left and the right, the skinning weights are probably one zero and zero one respectively. So they just move with the bone, and then in between you have this sort of weighted average. So for instance, at this point on the interface between these two rectangles, right, motion t one prime would have you go to the left, motion t two prime would have you go to the right. The skinning weights are maybe one half, one half, so you end up at the, the average point here. Okay, so that's a, a picture of, of, of what that looks like. Does that picture make sense and the, the formulas, all that good stuff? I think this is one of these algorithms that's conceptually simple and nobody appreciates how much of a headache it is to code, um, but, but that's okay. <laughs> all right. So does SSD have anything to do with physics? Did I like, Take a piece of 
that you like a piece of skin and like start stretching it out and seeing that it has anything to do with this this equation here. No, because I'm not you know a serial killer, but but also because like that's, this has, this is just a thing I made up, right? Like this has nothing to do with elasticity. It has nothing to do with physics or bones or stretching or whatever meat is going on inside of you and so on. Can anybody think of of some artifacts that you might see? Like like look, if I wanted to come up with a test that would show that SSD is not physics. Like, like where, where might it go wrong? Yeah, back here. Yeah, I think you'll have some like clipping just like just shown there. Some like clipping. Bone, or like the skin around bone two will like go inside the skin around bone one. Ah, yeah, that's an excellent point. So so <laughs> take a look at what happened here, right? These two points are somehow intersecting one another. And so like there's somehow a contradiction here, right? Like these these two things can't be true. It's it's, it's together and so just kind of averaging the results of two intersecting surfaces is not physical at all. What would it look like? Um, like what would it look like? Top. Fabulous question. So here uh, is an <laughs> image, right? So what happened in the interior here is you took this average of these two points. In this particular case, the surface didn't invert. I mean, you could imagine if you put the, the, these two joints at an even tighter angle, eventually you could get a loop here, um, which happens, right? I mean, you see uh, video games all the time that, that have this kind of artifact. Um, but what you can see is that the volume in the interior uh, near the elbow here has decreased quite a bit, right? And, and so clearly this is, is, is not a, a perfect model. In fact, we'll see some more examples of this kind of phenomenon later. Uh, and there's some really deep mathematical reasons for, for why this has nothing to do with like actual materials. So a few more uh, vocabulary words to, to fill in here. Lots of, lots of high level stuff. Um, we'll talk about the bind pose, which is just the pose of the skeleton inside of the, the mesh. Um, and so basically, uh, the point here is that we need uh, our coordinate systems to match up. So a detail that I've left out is that, that, what is that T precisely? Well, that T is a transformation from the bind pose to the current pose of the character, right? And so that's the kind of bookkeeping that we'll have to do. So. Um, Typically, the bind pose is written in some local coordinate system, right? Like that's our sort of typical way to talk about stuff from last lecture, right? Like I talk about the tip of your finger relative to the part before it, for example. Uh, and so I need to somehow take my local coordinate system all the way back to the global coordinate system of the mesh before I can apply that, that rigid motion. And this is where that skeleton hierarchy is going to come into play, right? And so the reality is there's actually two matrices that we need to compose together um, the final transformation we'll need for the skinning to get those, those bone transformations. One is concatenating the hierarchy of the bind pose back to the root triangle mesh, and the other is concatenating the hierarchy altogether for the like pose of the, the, the final character. Right? And, and so that's what we have to, to worry about here. I think I've said all this, it's just in the slide. So, so at the end of the day, this is what our formula really looks like. So there's actually two matrices, right? One is going from the local coordinates of the bone to the global coordinates of the mesh, and then the, or, or the other way around, rather, right? Because it's an inverse. Does that make sense, by the way, why there's an inverse here? Like, essentially, the mesh is in just like one set of coordinates for the whole mesh system, but the bone system is just like relative to the thing right above it, right? So I need to cope with that particular motion first. And then this guy is, is dealing with the deformation of the actual surface. So there's sort of two things that have to get composed together because the T is relative to the position of the bone. These are the kinds of things that I'm going to talk in circles and are very confusing, but I encourage you, like when you start your homework, it'll be very clear uh, what's, what's going on here. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's see here. I always get this stuff wrong. So the... <laughs> Um, right, because essentially what I'm, I'm accounting for is the relative motion between the rest pose and the deformed pose, right? And so this uh, pair of matrices is to compute the relative motion, right? If you think of both the B and the T as like the transformation from my body to the local coordinate system of the bone, then I need to like go out and then back it. <laughs> yeah, it's really easy to get backward. <laughs> Yeah, I probably just did in that previous sentence, but I'll, I'll let you guys uh, uh, try this at home. Okay, so in any event, that's, that's the basic formula here. The only thing to remember is that there's basically two different poses that matter. There's the T pose and the deformed pose. 
And we have to account for both of those when we do our, our SSD kind of deformation here. OK. Um, right, and as we already mentioned, there, there's a lot of different ways that this would come from. OK, so uh, at the end of the day, the skinning really is not so hard to implement. It's like in terms of number of lines of code, it's just easy to get those lines of code wrong. If you think about it, that, that B matrix, right, um, which goes you know, from, I guess, uh, local coordinates to world coordinates, uh, this thing is a constant, right? Because this just depends on your rest pose. The thing that's changing as a function of time is t, right? Because that's the thing that you're animating. Uh, and, and so a very typical thing to do might be to make a, a pass over your entire mesh and just go ahead and compute this product once before you start your animation. And then as you animate, just change the t's around and, and finish off this, this formula. Incidentally, if you recall, um, I believe uh, our, our colleague has some, some, some questions about this last time. Um, Remember that triangle meshes have normals attached to each vertex. So if I apply T B inverse to each uh, vertex position, what do I have to apply to the normals attached to the vertices? The inverse transpose of that product, right? That was that formula we proved at the end of our last lecture, just to, to give you a tiny bit more of a headache there. OK, so uh, here's what that formula looks like, right? So here's the thing that I applied to vertex i. So the correct transformation for the, the normal is the inverse transpose of the matrix that I, I apply to, to the vertex. Minus t here means minus 1, minus t. So it's inverse and then transpose, right? Or does it mean transpose and then inverse? That's exactly. It doesn't matter, but like I've never seen the minus t notation. Ah, yeah. So the minus t means inverse and transpose, and mathematically you can do them in whatever order yeah. you prefer. OK, so there's our, our skinning technique. Um, essentially, uh, the point here is that the weights and the bind pose are, are constant over time. What's changing are the, the things that are moving in response to the joints. Um, these things are all easily implemented on your graphics card, because this is just like one formula being applied a million times. And so in reality, of course, that's, that's what we do. I think in your assignment, we don't bother. But um, that, that, that's what's important. OK, so that's the basic skinning method. But we should point out that it's not perfect, because this is like maybe video games circa 20 years ago. And I think now it's certainly the case that like in most video games, when your characters bend their arms, they don't just like collapse to a, a point, uh, unless it's somehow uh, intentional. And we can actually kind of see that in this, this formula here. So if you think about it, right, if, I, if I parenthesize my, my skinning formula this way, which I can certainly do, right? So this is to take me from the rest pose pi to the uh, transform one, pi prime, then in some sense, this thing that I parenthesize is the matrix that's acting on uh, my positions. Right? And remember that roughly, this is the weighted average of a bunch of relative motions. right? Like the relative motion of the tip of my finger up versus sideways, or something like that. Right? That's what this matrix represents. So well, what goes wrong? Well, let's think about this for a second. So, Let's think just in, in two by two matrices. So, so remember our, our formula for two by two rotation matrices, like R of theta. It's like roughly cosine theta, sine of theta, minus sine. Did I get that right? I think that up to S I G N. I see fingers. Did I make a sign mistake? Or maybe I'm just rotating clockwise. You know, depends whether you're in the northern or southern hemisphere. <laughs> right, so uh, in particular, let's say that I rotate uh, 90 degrees. Then what's my, my matrix? So cosine of 90 degrees, 0, hopefully. What's sine of 90 degrees? You guys are killing me. 1. OK. Is that, did I get that right? I think I did. Um, let's do. Rotation of 90 minus 90 degrees. OK. Cosine of negative 90. I'm going to put you all on like remedial trigonometry. This is OK. We've got zeros here. Negative 1, 1. OK. So let's say I have um, a character. They're, they're, they're flexing their, their bicep. I would do that if I had one. And I, I bend it 180 degrees. So in essence, if we look at our skinning formula here, what am I doing? I'm really taking a weighted average of a bunch of like rotation translation matrices. 
So let's say that, that I have, you know, my, my forearm is rotating 90 degrees, my back arm, the other part of my arm is moving negative 90 degrees, right? So they make 180 degree angle total. So I average these things together to get the motion of my elbow. What do I get? What's the average of these two things? Zero. Is that a rotation matrix? No. So what happened to my elbow? It collapsed to a point, right? I took two things that preserve volume, I, I, I averaged them together, and I got something that just zeroes everything out. Now, there might still be translation in there, right? That's happening in that other part of my, my, my uh, uh, homogeneous coordinates. But the like rotation part of my matrix is just saying to collapse everything, right? And so remember how that elbow got smaller in that, that image we were seeing before, right? Like this. Uh, Ah, all the way back here a while ago. This thing like is, is the upper arm. That's basically what's going on, right? I'm, ro I'm like averaging together rotations, right, which are rigid motions, and what I get back is something that is not a rigid motion. You can't average stuff together. Um, and that's really what's wrong with this SSD method, is that I'm just like adding together rotation matrices, but that's not a space that I should be able to add stuff in. Right? The, in other words, the average of two rotations is itself not a rotation. Okay. Um, so that leads to what we often call a candy wrapper artifact, um, which is what you see here. So here, the character is taking their arm and just twisting it like that. I think technically, probably they're doing something slightly non-physical and like twisting the elbow. But in any event, you can see what happens as the volume uh, decreases, which is a very typical uh, issue and, and, and one that, that happens with SSD uh, style methods. There are many fixes to this. Um, essentially, the problem here is that we'd like to take an average in the space of rotations, but we didn't do that, right? We took an average in some space, but it didn't end up being a rotation at the end of the day. Uh, it turns out the space of rotations is something we can call a manifold. It's got like this nice curved geometry structure. And so the more kind of complex skinning methods basically take more sophisticated notions of, of that average, essentially replacing that term we parenthesized with something that makes a little bit more sense for, for a weighted average. Um, there are also all kinds of other clever techniques. So I, I believe a couple lectures ago, somebody was asking us about quaternions. And actually, I think the dominant method for skinning is something called dual quaternion skinning, which is essentially just a technique that replaces that weighted average with a, a weighted average in quaternion space, which is a different way to um, represent uh, rotations. OK, um, some other kind of things that we should clean up at the end of our discussion here. One is, of course, where to get these weights from. Again, the typical approach here is just to, to, to paint them on, but there do exist automatic uh, methods out there. Um, the automatic uh, universe, by the way, there, there are different ways that you could imagine doing it automatically. One of them might be to just know where the positions of the bones are and then do some kind of reasonable thing based on proximity. This is actually totally reasonable. This is called geometric skinning weights. Um, these days, people also study machine learning problems because we do for all problems. Um, and in skinning, that actually makes some sense. Like if I see a character you know, in a few different poses, then maybe I can kind of infer the influence of the bone structure based on the, the poses that I see. That's a hard uh, data analysis problem because you typically don't have very much data to work with. Um, a different question you can ask would be to automatically rig, right? Like given just a 3D character, can I place that skeleton inside of it? This is a problem that's also been studied. It goes all the way back to 2007 um, from, from Ilya Baran and, and, and Popovich. Uh, which, which really led to some fun stuff. So here's like an early um, method for doing this. This is called Pinocchio, which makes sense given the context. And it's not playing on my laptop, which is frustrating. Oh no, I like this video. Oh, it's talking. There it is. Ah, okay, so there's our, there's our man. And the question is, how would I rig this thing? And maybe I have a generic skeleton rig. So like I actually have an animation of this thing walking around. I'd like to put that animation on this mesh, right? So in order to do that, I need to actually take those things and place them inside of the character, right? That's this rigging process. And that's what Pinocchio does. And it can lead to some really creepy things. So let's, let's see in a moment. All right, so here's a bunch of characters that were automatically rigged with Pinocchio. And now they can all do, what, Tai Chi or something. I'm actually not sure where the like the animation of the skeleton comes from, whether they did it by hand or, or it's captured. 
This is work from the MIT Computer Graphics Lab back in the early 2000s. And these tools actually do get adopted because these are things that like essentially you can automatically rig and then probably adjust a little bit by hand uh, if, you're, if you're an artist. Right. So as a quick recap for the day, we, we discussed first just at a high level, like different types of animations and where they go. And in particular, this course, we're going to focus on keyframing, which we talked about a bit today, procedural animation, uh, and physically based animation. Physically based animation will take up most of our time uh, because that's the one that, that requires the most algorithms. Uh, we talked about different ways of controlling uh, animation by essentially controlling the motion of the different joint angles, for example. And then finally, we talked about skinning, which is really just the idea that I can move every part of the body with all the different rigid motions that compose together you know, the motions of the individual sort of pieces. And then we just take weighted average, where the averaging weights are either computer generated or, or made by hand. So uh, with that, I will see you next time. Don't forget your homework. And uh, next time, we'll talk about physically based animation. We'll do some, some ODE. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, see you later. Let me stop this thing. Okay, give me just a moment. No problem. Yeah, this thing.